Welcome everyone. Welcome everyone um, to the meeting of the Law School Council. Um, I would like to start by inviting um, our new um, team members to introduce themselves. Um, we have Cody Hunanian. I'll go ahead and start with you. Great, thank you so much, Nadia. Uh, yes, this is Cody Hunanian. I am a uh, new addition to the team. Uh, my role here is going to be, uh, or is, uh, Program Director of uh, Policy, Data, and Aims in the Admissions Department. Uh, just a quick primer, my background has been about 10 years of experience in education and policy, particularly around uh, access and affordability. So really excited to talk with folks on today's call because I think there's a lot of intersectionality there. And uh, it's my third day, so bear with me as uh, I'm a very fresh addition to the team. Thank you, Cody, and welcome. Thank you so Thank much. You. Um, next, if um, Teresa Polinski would introduce herself to the group. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, as Nydia said, my name is Teresa Solensky. I am a senior program analyst in the Office of Admissions um, under Ed Standards. Um, thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to um, this meeting. Thank you, Teresa. Happy to have you on, on board. Um, also, I would just like to let everyone know that the meeting with the public trust liaison will be taking place at 2 p.m. So for those who are interested in that, that will be happening at two o'clock. Um, Teresa, if we could move forward with um, taking the role. Apologies. Um, Susan Bakshi, Bakshian? Bakshian, Bakshian, however you want to do it, it is just fine with me and I'm here. Mary Basic. It's basic and I'm here too. Christopher Ide Dong. Uh yeah, it's uh Ide Dong and I'm present. Devin uh Kinyon. I'm Kinyon and I'm here too. Mary Beth Mulan. Moylan and present. Nydia Johnson. Present. There is a quorum. Wonderful. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you. And now um, we um, are at the part of our meeting where members of the public may make a public comment. Um, public comment may be sent to lsc at calbar.ca.gov, and it will be distributed to the law school council. Uh, the public can also sign up online to make an in-person public comment, and those signing up in advance will be heard. First, we don't have any um, any signups in advance, but anyone can make a uh, public comment by raising their hand um, during this meeting, or um, if, you, if joining us by phone by pressing star nine. Uh, public comments are limited to two minutes. Um, and uh, we will have a, a timer or we'll be keeping time on our end. Any public comment at this time? Yes, we do have two public comments. And when the person is doing the public comment, we'll have a timer visible on the screen of Teresa Solensky so that the commenter will know um, how much time is, is remaining in their two minute comment period. Um, and with that, I'd like to recognize our first commenter. Uh, this is Ray Hayden, JD, please. Hi, Ray Hayden here. And I wanna start off by saying that I'm highly impressed with the good things that I see from CalBar and CalBar staff. However, there's a couple of virtually important things uh, or vitally important things that must be addressed and corrected. Changing it, I'm, I'm sorry, this really isn't for this meeting, but I need to get it on public record for CalBar. Uh, changing the bar exam from three days to two changed nothing. Lowering the cut score from 1440 to 139 has also done nothing. In fact, the effect has actually been that the score scaling has moved one notch to the left, effectively, effectively assuring that nothing would change. Dropping the third reading uh, that people who would have passed will now fail knowingly and, and intentionally, and this is in public documents with CalVar, that's pretty much unforgivable. Uh, ExamSoft botched our files in October 2020, and I have my printed answer, answers which demonstrate them. I wrote them, and I can't stand looking at them. ExamSoft really botched our answers again in July of 2021, and that was so bad, CalBar gave me my money back. Uh, people are continuing, uh, people, I'm not mentioning any names. Their names show up when they say it, what they say. 
Uh, but people are continuing to state that the MBE is vitally important to the scaling of the entire exam when both IELTS and the NCBE, the people who make the thing, publicly admitted that the MBE is completely invalid, which is why it won't be on the next gen bar exam, which is another story of the continuing problem of the NCBE. All of these actions are a clear demonstration as to why the program I propose at zero cost to anyone, I don't need money, I do this for free and I give it away and I've been doing it for 20 years to emergency services personnel, all right? Uh, my program could be still could still be up and running by February 2024, but it would need hardcore motivation, dedication, and raw determination, but it could certainly be up and running successfully long before July 2024. My program is good for everyone. I don't see the timer. Uh, my, good, my program is good for everyone. It's a win-win-win-win situation, and it assures greater protection for the general public, assures greater competence of newly licensed lawyers, and guarantees a more diverse and balanced California Bar membership. It's also completely remote and saves Cal Bar millions and millions of dollars. And I can demonstrate that. Thank you very much for your time and have a great meeting. Thank you, Ray. We thank you for your comment. Okay, uh, the, we do have additional commenters. And uh, on this for this first comment, we were not able to see the timer. If we're not able to see for the second, uh, we will give a 30 second warning and uh, to compensate for the time it takes to announce the warning, we'll adjust the two minute time period uh, by a, a similar number of seconds. And Teresa, let me know when uh, it would be appropriate for me to recognize the next commenter. Give me one second. I think we are ready. I have um, a stopwatch ready. I'm not sure if it's showing up on my screen though. I'm not seeing it. So let's go ahead and use the, and use the timer with the announcement. Um, and I would like to recognize uh, Todd, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I actually submit this for uh, an item that's on the agenda where you guys are to discuss uh, future topics that are viable for discussion by this uh, esteemed body. Uh, and I welcome you as, as new members uh, to the council. My name is Todd Hill. Um, I do have a, a, um, a case history. It's currently dismissed. It's not active, but it is in federal court. It's case number 2, colon 23-CV. Dash zero one two nine eight dash JLS dash PDX. I'm sorry, I'm not responsible for the coding system. Again, that note is two colon two three dash CV dash zero one two nine eight dash JLS dash PDX. Uh, my law school defrauded me and prevented me from obtaining my degree after completing all required coursework. I matriculated to People's College of Law, a registered fixed facility school, in August 2019. As of today, August 24th, 2023. I remain without substantive transcript, degree, or monies returned. The State Bar has been aware of extraordinary record-keeping and compliance challenges at least since 2017 at the school. It failed to warn the public. Instead of assistance, State Bar has elected to facially adopt and employ delay, plausible denial, rhetoric, and lulling tactics. Plausible denial, including the two-minute timer here, which it's very hard to coherently communicate a legal case of this complexity to a group in two minutes or less. I went to the State Bar for assistance. Instead, its admissions and executive staff, directors, and agents assisted the institution. Ironically, the State Bar did so while parroting its commitment to public protection, while implementing and enforcing policies that prohibit the sole regulator of intervening between students and their schools. I'll wrap it up. Here, State Bar acts as if students are not members of the public because it has the authority to do so. This is likely not the case. Thank you for the time. Mr. Hill, that was designed to be the 30 second warning. So if you have additional comment, please do feel free to add. I'm not sure any additional comment would yield any substantive change. Thank you very much for your the extra time, Ms. Leonard. Okay, thank you. We thank you for your comment, Todd. Thank you. And then Teresa, let me know when you're ready. Um, I'll announce the name of the next commenter. We're actually just to prepare her, I'll, I'll recognize Lisa Ferreira, uh, but we will announce when your uh, microphone is open for your two minute public comment. Uh, thank you for your patience for just a moment. Thank you. Um, I am just to here to just, I am the Dean of Students at California Western School of Law. 
And I am here to listen and will stay to listen regarding um, the San Diego um, administration. And so I, we have all publicly commented. And so I just appreciate that and hope um, that the State Bar will take in the spirit of not only what's possible for February, but for the future of the bar examination. Thank you. Thank you. That for your comment, thank you. There are no further individuals indicating that they wish to make a public comment. So the public comment period will now close. Great, thank you. And thank you to everyone for those contributions. Um, we will now um, move forward to discussion and approval of the um, May 4th Law School Council public meeting minutes. Um, does anyone have any changes or updates to those minutes at this time? Okay, seeing no changes or comments. Um, Teresa, can we uh, move forward with uh, calling a vote? Um, Susan Bashian? I think we just approve, right? It's not a vote. It's not a yay or nay. It's an approve. I, I don't think we need a first or a second. I don't think it's a vote. For the minutes, we do. We generally do a vote. So we need a first, a second, and then we need a first and a second then. Mm -hmm. I'll move to approve. Second. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, so we, I believe we had a motion from Susan and I missed the second, apologies. I seconded Mary Beth. Mary Beth, thank you, Mary Beth. Okay. Now, can we move forward with the vote? Uh, Susan Bakshian? Yes. Mary Basic? Approved. Christopher I.D. Don? Yes. Kevin, uh, Devin Kenyon? Yeah. Mary Beth Mulan? Yes. Nydia Johnson? Yes. The motion passes. Thank you. Thank you for that. Natalie, I'll turn over to you now, I think. It'll help if I unmute. Okay, at this point, we're going to turn to the staff reports. We have reports from a number of staff and we'll begin by talking about the report on the 2024 bar exam administration plan. I'd like to recognize Amy Nunez, please. Hello, good afternoon, council members. Um, I have a PowerPoint um, that Teresa will be bringing up um, to share with you about the 2024 exam administrations. So as many of you uh, may be aware, uh, due to the deficient state of the admissions budget, uh, we've looked at uh, uh, ways of uh, coming up with um, fun, uh, a way to meet our expenditures. So we've looked at our fees, we've proposed increases for nearly all of the applications for services in the Office of Admissions. Uh, can we go to slide two, please? Um, and one of the things that, um, is a current reality is that the current proposals uh, for increases to admission fees, they still result in uh, in, in a deficit. Uh, they will exceed our projected revenue by about $1.054 million. And so what that's done is uh, staff have explored uh, measures for addressing bud budget issues by also exploring measures that would reduce exam costs. Uh, so we have targeted the California bar exam because it represents a single largest expenditure outside of our personnel costs. Um, next slide, please. And so uh, in June of 2023, we proposed four different models to the committee of bar examiners that would reduce uh, the cost of the bar exam uh, for uh, the full year of 2023. There are These are the uh, four different models. The first is not changing anything about the bar exam, and uh, this is operating on an as-is model. In that model, um, we would uh, provide the exam as we do now. Uh, that is, the essays in the PT and the MBE would all be administered in person 
at multiple uh, test sites across the state. In February, we tested about 10 to 12 uh, test sites, and in July, anywhere between 14 and 16 sites. The cost for that model is about $5.6 million on an annual basis. We proposed a six site model, and that is using less, uh, a, less a reduced number of uh, test sites um, with what we're calling super sites. Um, that is sites that can host anywhere between 1,300 up to 2,600 applicants in one single test site. So under this model, we have three testing accommodation sites. That is sites that are strictly uh, 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 open for um, or seating testing accommodation applicants and three standard test sites. Of those three standard test sites, they would be able to uh, hold and uh, host both TA and um, and standard testing uh, applicants. Uh, the implications with the six set test sites is that there are no sites in Sacramento, Oakland, or in San Diego, and the uh, this model would yield a savings of about eight hundred and fifty five thousand dollars. We also discussed the idea of hosting one day remote. Um, as you may recall, uh, the MBE, the multi-state bar examination, is um, a section of the UBE that we borrow from the National Conference of uh, Bar Examiners. That is, we procure this, and their regulations prohibit the ability to uh, administer the MBE remotely. And as a result, we would, we're would we proposing to have one day remote, that would be the California portion of the exam, the essays and the PT, and the in-person component would uh, in, in, in involve simply the MBE. And so um, for this, uh, under this model, we would use the same test sites that were proposed previously, the three super sites and the three uh, uh, TA sites. And um, it results also in not having a testing space in Sacramento, Oakland, or San Diego. And this yields a cost savings of $1.5 million. Um, this model though, um, also requires reorganizing the exam days. Uh, given that we'll have one exam day that is scheduled to be in person and an exam day that would be uh, require remote testing, we would need to allow sufficient time for applicants to travel uh, back to where they would be taking a remote exam. And for these re for this reason, it might uh, result in shuffling uh, the exam days. So they would not happen back to back. Uh, we could have a model, for example, where we'd start the MBE on the actual MBE day because we are required to start uh, to conduct the MBE uh, on the same day as everybody else nationally. And so, um, and possibly having the, the essays and the PT uh, the early in the following week, as an example. But the idea is that um, we would allow a sufficient time for people to travel and to complete uh, the entire portion of the essays and the um, and the PT before um, taking the MBE or vice versa. And so uh, that is a one important consideration that uh, was factored in and explained to the CVE when this conversation happened back in June. The last model here is. Uh, similar to the um, six sites with one remote day, with the exception that we were proposing to use the state bar offices in lieu of two of the TA sites. And so it would be the three same standard test sites that I mentioned, this are super sites, uh, one TA site, and then we would use uh, each of the state bar offices, the one in downtown Los Angeles and the one in San Francisco uh, for testing accommodation applicants. And this would yield a more savings, uh, $1.8 million approximately. Again, this model has the same uh, consideration that we'd have to make uh, uh, as I proposed with the one day remote. And that is allowing sufficient time for applicants to travel um, back to their destinations wherever they would be taking the remote portion of the exam. And so um, here, uh, when this was proposed in June, the option that was selected by the conference, uh, by the CBE, sorry, is um, the four sites with one remote day. Uh, next slide, please. So um, since that, at that meeting, uh, one of the suggestions was for us to explore the possibility of um, also a copy uh, of um, looking for uh, free, uh, free space or testing space that would be free of charge to us. And staff have identified that and for that reason, when uh, we 
presented this to the board about two weeks ago after the CBE meeting, the recommendations changed a bit. And they changed, uh, again, because we were able to identify free, uh, some free testing space. And also because one of the proposals, this idea of uh, uh, testing remotely for testing accommodation applicants, um, it, it needs a little more development. Um, as you may recall, during the remote administered exams of 20, uh, October 2020, that would have been the July, and both exams in 2021, we had uh, some applicants that were not able to test remotely um, and some that elected not to test remotely and test in person because perhaps they didn't have uh, testing space at home or whatever the case might be. But for those that had incompatibility issues uh, between their uh, testing accommodation and uh, our remote testing vendor, they had to come in person. And what staff wanna propose is um, they, we want more time to explore methods for being able to do that. That is a method that would allow uh, remote testing for all applicants. And so we're recommending that we keep the 2024 uh, model as is, that is it would be an in-person exam for everyone until we explore and uh, determine whether we can have a model where all applicants would be able to test remotely uh, in July. And so um, this is uh, what the uh, board uh, adopted. And so um, we have now five contracted sites. I will talk about um, what, what those are, but they include the State Bar Office in Los Angeles as we initially proposed in the reduced model um, uh, proposal. Also, we have identified testing space in downtown San Francisco at the Judicial Council office. And we've also added a TA site in Sacramento for um, areas that, uh, for applicants that uh, need to test in, uh, in uh, private rooms or semi-private rooms. Next slide, please. So here uh, is uh, some of the factors that um, contributed to the site selection. So uh, much of it has to do with a combination of effects. So um, this is related to the, um, uh, some of it is related to the availability of venues um, that we needed to make sure that we had uh, su uh, sufficient seating capacity. I mentioned that the three super sites um, seat anywhere between, you know, at, at a minimum 1300 applicants and up to 2600 applicants. So the super sites allow um, us to um, be able to uh, effic efficiently sit as many applicants as we could, and also to have the um, to meet the testing needs that we have. We have to have a sufficient um, lighting, um, uh, you know, workrooms where we keep our material, where proctors um, will um, gather for their orientation. So. The venues needed to meet a certain set of criteria, and we were able to identify that. Now, um, we added Sacramento, as I noted, because we the Judicial Council did not have uh, enough to serve those that I mentioned will be testing in private or semi-private room. Uh, the model that um, all of the models uh, assume that we're going to have between 5,500 and 6,000 applicants in February 2024, which is why we really need to be very cost efficient with the seating capacity. Um, one of the uh, issues that was raised is um, this idea of uh, San Diego, like that San Diego was no longer a testing um, uh, site for us. And and um, it was an issue that was also a concern that was raised at the Board of Trustees meeting two weeks ago. They directed staff to go back and reevaluate whether we can explore all our options in San Diego to uh, make a uh, San Diego, the a testing space in, in lieu of Ontario. And this is also in response to feedback that we received in public during the public comment period about these models. And so staff have gone back. We've gone to uh, back to looking at uh, every testing facility that's uh, feasible, not only in San Diego, but even in a 60 mile radius. So we even looked at um, various casino locations outside of um, San Diego, and we have not been able to identify uh, that space. Um, and so uh, a lot of thought went into um, and research went into uh, electing uh, Ontario over San Diego. And then uh, San Francisco and Sacramento, I've already mentioned that um, we will be using uh, space in Sacramento for testing accommodation applicants. Um, and in terms of using the office, uh, we um, 
are in the process of trying to sell the San Francisco building. And some of that might require um, uh, uh, some work in the office uh, with the um, uh, uh, with all of the considerations that and and planning that happens with selling a, a, a space. Uh, we thought we would explore other options in San Francisco. We were able to gain access to the uh, uh, Judicial Council uh, building, and so um, that's how we ended up with that testing location. I, I talked about cost is a very big factor. Um, we are impacted by uh, increasing prices at hotel venues. So post-pandemic, um, hotels um, and uh, uh, convention centers, the costs for these uh, renting these spaces have increased significantly. Um, and the fact that the state bar does not contract for food or beverage makes us less appealing to a lot of these facilities. And so um, this is just uh, making it further challenging for us to keep our costs low. Um, also, in every uh, examination um, space that we considered, we also took into account uh, the impact that it would have on our testing accommodation applicants. And so all of these factors are what contributed to the site selections that we have. Next slide, please. So here is um, where we are with the testing, uh, the test sites. So as you can see here, uh, here are the test sites that we recommended in June and uh, the recommendations that we made to the board and where we are now. So in, uh, in terms of standard test sites in San Francisco, in the Bay Area, we'll be at um, in Daly City at the Cow Palace. Um, and that site holds about 2,600 people. In Pasadena, uh, we are uh, going to be um, in Los Angeles at Pasadena. That is our super site there. And um, I believe we can sit up to um, 1,800 people in Pasadena. And then we'll be going to Ontario, which can seat up to 2,300. So those are going to be our um, standard test sites, um, our super sites. Uh, in terms of testing accommodations, uh, as I mentioned, at the Cow Palace, we'll have some testing accommodation space, as well as the Judicial Council um, in downtown San Francisco. We will also be in Sacramento at the um, Arden West. Um, we're going to be in the Los Angeles downtown office. We'll be in Orange. And as I noted earlier, um, we have now determined that we'll be in Ontario rather than San Diego. Um, and that Ontario space will be able to facilitate testing accommodation applicants as well. Um, next slide, please. So uh, what does this mean for February 2024 examinees? Uh, the downside um, to this model is that there is no testing space that um, uh, sometimes uh, that we would typically find at a test schedule. That is, no space in Oakland. There are is no space in uh, Burlingame. Uh, there is no uh, space in San Diego, and there is no space for standard testing in Sacramento. Uh, we're going to have new testing locations. Cal Palace might be new to some applicants, but uh, the state bar has tested there about. Um, I believe uh, 10 years ago. And we're also gonna be using um, state bar offices. Um, and for those of you may, who may not know this, but we've used the state bar offices for some uh, tests, uh, primarily for the first year law student exam um, ever since the pandemic. So um, it's a test, uh, test site that we have used uh, for prior and continue to use for uh, exam administrations, but it may be new to uh, 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 bar examinees. Um, as for what's going to stay the same is our exam rules. So the same prohibited items, uh, this, we're going to have the same, uh, the same prohibited items will remain prohibited. Our uh, time, um, uh, the uh, amount of time for the exam is going to be the same. The schedule will be the same. Our security standards in terms of our seating, our proctor ratio, how we handle all of our confidential test material, all of that will stay the same. Um, there is a possibility that we may not have, um, we'll have some flexibility in people being able to have, bring water into the testing room and we will inform applicants as that time comes. Also, um, so th these are our plans right now for February, 2024. Uh, by July 2024, if we have determined a method for testing, like I said, all applicants, um, we might have a shift in modalities. So we may propose going to that remote 
uh, July exam and keeping February, um, or that's already been determined, keeping February in person. So um, we are going to be presenting this to the board in September, um, where we'll have more discussion and again, uh, present a recommendation for July, 2024. Next slide. Okay, I think that's it. Um, are there any questions about uh, the exam? Okay, yes, already, Mary Beth. I think we had a race for how many, whose hands go up <laughs> first there. Um, I win, okay. Um, so I, I, let me let me first ask, is there a public comment period that is still open for people to be expressing concerns about this plan or is that time passed? No, there will be. Um, so the time has passed for the proposal that was brought to the um, board in um, a few weeks ago, um, but we're going to have a new proposal that's going to be coming to the board at the September meeting. So um, there is opportunity uh, for public comment at that at that time. Okay, um, so I, I'm also wondering if anyone has looked into, I mean, you mentioned the rise in hotel costs, the rise in and how that has become um, an issue for the state bar, but it seems like this plan just passes off that problem to the applicants, many of whom are not situated to be able to shoulder that burden. So you by removing a standard testing site from Sacramento, for example, where I am, um, you're leaving basically the entire Central Valley without an access and everyone will have to go and purchase hotel rooms and stay overnight in San Francisco, which is way more expensive a market for hotels than Sacramento. Um, and it strikes me that there needs to be some kind of study about how this will impact um, both our, just all of our students, but maybe in particular students who experience socioeconomic challenges and whether this will have an impact on students who are from um, backgrounds where they, they are, you know, not uh, financially able to shoulder this. And I wonder if there's been an equity assessment for how these additional costs will impact applicants from various backgrounds. Um, I, so, and I guess I'm having, a, we've always had it either at the convention center or at Mather um, uh, base here in Sacramento. Those are huge, huge locations. It's not clear to me why the state bar is simply passing off the increased cost to our applicants in this way. So I'll get off my soapbox now. Okay. Um, but Mary Beth, I do want to um, respond to a couple of things that you raised. One is that um, in the initial public comment period with um, that we presented to the Board of Trustees, that did come up in terms of the reports on the fairness and equity of, um, of uh, the planning that went into this. And um, we, we did our best to try to find space again that was um, that would be cost effective and efficient where we could have as many uh, applicants as possible. Sacramento was a very difficult choice for us. Um, where we've been working, uh, we've been going to the Safe Credit Union, I think, for the past um, two or three exam administrations. Um, uh, that has been uh, challenging for us to sustain um, in terms of um, the amount of space that's available to us and uh, just contracting issues in general um, at that location. We looked at um, other areas around that, even looking at one, I believe it's in um, Rockland, uh, just looking at that area and in terms of cost effectiveness, it has not uh, turned out to be as cost effective as the locations that we did find. So, um, but again, I think that um, I think you're doing the right thing. I'm thinking about ways of providing this public comment to the board before um, the September meeting. So um, I think that's the way to go. Thank you. Susan. Hi, Susan. Hi, Amy. Just a quick clarification. So the current plan that's in place is for February to remain the typical two day live model and July 2024 would be the first time we would start the MBE in person and the California administered remote. Yes. So possibly. my question is for the going forward after that, 
would the plan be that February was always a two-day live option or after July of 2024, would we permanently move to one day remote, one day live? Permanently I, while we're still using the MBE. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I think if we can work out the kinks, sorry, Amy, working yeah. out the kinks of how to deliver the exam in two ways for July 24, then moving forward, as long as we're using the MBE before it's phased out, um, that would be how we imagine delivering it. So um, theoretically, then February will not remain as a two-day live option if we move to the split kind of exam with one day remote, one day live. Right. But and I that's not the plan. I get it. It's a plan and things could change. But I'm just trying to figure out whether 2024 is a one off year or we are instituting a new change that will then go forward. And that's the expectation. Well, I think there, um, the NCBE will stop delivering the MBE after 2025. So maybe it's like February 2026. I'm, I don't have that in front of me. But so regardless, there's going to be so many bar exam changes to come, right? Um, but if we work out how to deliver it um, remotely for one day, and if it does realize the cost savings that we imagine it can, then I believe we will keep administering it that way after July 24. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure that I understood what, what the plan is. Great. All right, um, Christopher. Yeah, thank you, Amy, for all that information. I, there were some questions that have already been raised by my law school. Um, one was uh, the fee increase sort of costing more to take the bar, yet taking a remote day. How does that play out? Um, another issue would be, I think what Mary Beth mentioned, the equity issue. We have students that will not have a remote place to take it. So the law school will probably end up hosting it. It would be great to know as soon as possible um, the dates of when that in person, uh, the remote day would be, and also if the rules will be amended so that we can have group testing. Uh, because right now we, under the old rules, as you remember, it was one student per classroom uh, and we anticipate having 250 grads. So just trying to figure that out, um, but I'll leave it at that. Okay. Well, Christopher, um, you know, um, some of what you're asking, uh, we just have to wait in terms of, um, we, we don't have an answer, for example, to um, when the actual testing dates would be for the MBE and the other remote exam. But in terms of, um, in, in relation to the question uh, about um, being able to test in one room, the technology has not changed. Part of why people weren't able to test in a room remotely is for fear that, um, you know, if there was an interruption, uh, we couldn't have somebody else in the other room because you get flagged for um, not being alone in a room. But also if somebody were to have technical issues, it could be disruptive to multiple applicants. Um, and, and being in the room alone is one of the uh, major requirements for remote testing. So, um, you know, if I had to answer that now, that would not be feasible if that was happening for the February bar exam. So, um, but, you know, perhaps we could talk about other ideas, but between the audio and the video requirements, testing in a room, um, in a classroom style, um, would not be beneficial to applicants in a remote testing environment. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I guess the, that gets back to just the point of uh, many of our students will turn back to us to host them. And if the bar ends up being pushed, let's say, into August, we run into first years and summer school, et cetera. So just something to, for, for you all to think about. Thank you. Understood. OK, thank you. All right, uh, Mary. I, I First, I want to say I really appreciate it. I know you guys have put a lot of work into trying to come up with alternatives um, with the budget crunch, and I appreciate that. I have a kind of, it might sound silly, but a little bit of a practical consideration. If we're moving to these super sites, my, and I don't know, you guys might know more than I do, but I would think it would take a lot more energy and time to like check people in. And my concern is a really practical one. If that three hour testing time is now stretching to much longer than that, and we're in these very large locations, Honestly, like access to the bathroom can be a real problem for people who are in the far reaches and have, is there any consideration being given to maybe adding a little bit of extra time into the timed test because it's such a tight time frame that really is a disadvantage if it's having to stretch. Now, maybe you guys can get them in, checked in really fast and I, I don't, you know, I don't know that, but that was just a practical concern that I had. Okay, so um, 
it's it's a great concern because um it's it's something that we had in mind when we went to uh, select the sites and do our walkthroughs is um if, if you know if there were only two restrooms for a thousand people um that would not work so ensuring that there was um uh, you know uh, kind of um a, an equivalent ratio to the number of restrooms that we have now at some of our facilities um i think uh, that is something that was factored into uh, the site selection um and, but in terms of uh, making more time, for example, everybody going in and out during um, the lunch period or coming back, I think that is something that um, we should bring back. We are in the in, in uh, planning with staff on what does um, how is working at a super site different than working at a site. So, uh, it's, uh, Mary, that's a good point. We can bring that back to our staff to consider. All right. Uh, hi, Devin. Hello. Uh, uh, thank you all for this information. There was we've been had so many questions from our students and our faculty about what's been happening, and so the fact that there's some clarity is going to be so so useful to us. Um, I share my colleagues' concerns about both some of the issues around fewer sites in February. You know, we're in the Bay Area, so like the reality is, Daly City not going to matter that much. Most of our folks took it to Oakland; it's going to work out. But we definitely have alums who are in both Sacramento area and folks in sort of far Southern Cal uh, California. So. You know, I share some concerns about the fact that we are reducing the number of options and essentially pushing the costs onto bar takers. Um, my bigger concern, and I was sort of glad it's not a February thing, but I'm so deeply concerned about sort of the July remote option. Uh, the exams that were given during the pandemic were terrible for our bar takers. Um, I suspect that your staff got the brunt of that heat, but we took a lot of that heat too. And effectively, we're going right back to a thing that we know worked very poorly for the bar takers. Um, and, you know, considering that like likelihood is that the week that that will happen, like Chris said, we're going to be getting back in action for the new school year. So it's going to put a lot of pressure on us to try to sort of manage space for, you know, a hundred or so of our people, which is about as many as we're going to be able to fit into the building, while also trying to accommodate the new year. Um, I know a lot of our students have asked me why these changes are happening on top of all the fee increases, and it's really hard to sort of give them an answer with a straight face. Um, and, and so I hope that our staff and the board of trustees is really candid about, you know, we know that these are hard decisions that are having to be made, and we know that we're hitting bar takers twice, um, mm -hmm. because right now it just seems deeply insensitive to a lot of our, our folks who are getting ready to take the exam. Yeah. Yeah. Well, those are great points, Devin. Thank you. All right, and um, um, Nydia. Thank you. Thank you, Amy, for, for that and I appreciate the information. Uh, one of the kind of concerns that I have is um, about the move to remote in July with the California component of the exam and just where um, the exam integrity component comes in, particularly in light of what we're seeing with generative AI all of the possibilities and the speed at which that technology operates, um, whether considerations were given to that and how that um, impacts the integrity of this examination, where you know essentially the state bar you know, has a duty to the public of the attorneys that it is passing forward. And if we have an entire uh, component that it, we are returning back to making remote at a time where we just have all of this information about this technology that makes it easier and much more rapid to be able to devise an answer. Um, and I understand, you know, uh, cheating and how that can occur. And there's different you know, ways people can discreetly do that. But it just feels like we're in an era right now where that is actually been magnified a um, um, hundred times over. So I I'm just interested in how um, that's been considered um, in in moving like the California writing component to remote. Mm -hmm. um, that's a really good point. And and um, exam security and exam um, integrity are really um, huge values that we want to uh, uh, factor into our determination on um, even a remote vendor and the process itself. And so we, we plan to use um, something that's uh, like... Uh, you know, I'll be candid, it, it'll probably be exam soft in the sense, um, and exam soft, one of the things is that um, it doesn't rely on AI even to um, to get the candidate up in testing. There is AI that's part of what flags the um, 
uh, the potential um, uh, uh, behavior that does not conform to our rules. Um, but um, it's a record and review process, so people could continue testing and we um, investigate um, any of these flags. So, and then in terms of exam security, um, because of the design of ExamSoft, you are not able to access the internet as you're testing. Um, you're locked out of all of that. So, um, and that's why during the testing, you do not need access to the internet altogether. You do it um, once you're going in and you're exiting from the um, system itself. And so um, that helps us, it assures us uh, of examining integrity in terms of um, the security that um, uh, around being exposed to the questions um, and being exposed to them at the appropriate times, that is um, that inaccessibility after the exam session's over. Thank, thank you, Amy. I apologize if I didn't um, begin that with, I, I'm aware of the security uh, that exam soft has and how it shuts down. I'm referring more to the rapid speed at which one could have a secondary device transcribe the question and populate given the predictive nature of sources like ChatGPT to put together a really strong bar minimally competent response. Um, so that that was more my concern is um, I'm aware of the security limitations of something like exam soft and uh, what it picks up in the flags and also just how many flags it it throws and the really laborious effort of reviewing those flags to actually find out what is actually um you know uh, inappropriate um, conduct so that so sorry for that but that that was my concern oh yeah well and we also um uh part of our exam soft and um uh contract and also um uh the rules that we provide our applicants um they're not allowed we're not allowing um, external uh, monitors, for um, for example, and that helps with exam security as well. Okay. All right, uh, Mary Beth. Yeah, I just want to um, mention because I think a lot of us have moved back away from doing any sort of remote testing in law school because of some of these concerns. And most of us are using ExamSoft for our exams in law school, I'm sure. I know we do. We don't do it with, um, you know, we do it in a proctored environment because we want to ensure that people don't have a second device. And I know that the, the bar was using during the remote time, the like also the whatever that is, the watching software that went along with the exam soft. So um, there's a word for that. I'm sorry, I'm not coming oh, up with what- ex Exam monitor and exam ID. Okay, right. So, um, but I, I think that Nydia's concern is that only goes so far and that people will find ways to get around some of that. And there are privacy concerns, I guess, as well with um, watching people and with people having sufficiently uh, private and, and okay spaces in which to not have the flags. I do want to echo Chris's comments about that's going to push a lot of um, responsibility back on the law schools to help our graduates find those kinds of spaces. And for schools that are more opportunity schools that have more students who are socioeconomically disadvantaged and don't have those spaces, you're putting more of a burden on the schools that take more students that will need more help to find those spaces. And again, like Devin and Chris were saying, asking us to do it at a time when we're already very, very busy and, and orientations are coming in for the next group of students. So I guess I would just like to echo what a lot of people have said that the remote piece is um, different than what we are doing. We all, well, I, I'll only speak for my law school. We decided the remote exams were really problematic from an integrity perspective. We have pivoted back, even for some of our online classes, we're giving in-person exams. And so if we are going to have a remote component, especially for the written piece, right, that, and again, I think this was Nydia's point that for the essays in particular, where we have AI developing so quickly at any time, um, it, it strikes me that we will have to think about then also how we're preparing our students, because if they're going to be doing a remote test and not in a proctored environment, then 
and we're preparing them for proctored in-person exams, we need to all know that with some good advance notice because we've really pivoted away from that. Okay. Great points. Thank you, Mary Beth. Thank you. All right. I have, um, I have anything else, Madam? Okay, Amy, thank you. Um, and thank you to everyone for the questions and the, um, the helpful and engaged feedback on this topic. Um, given the time, I want to propose a little bit of reorganization. We do have our uh, meeting with our public trust liaison special set at 2 p.m. So prior to that, I suggest that we discuss the oath card report that I have prepared and, and the recent developments, which I'll do um, now, and then our diversity SEAL team will come to talk with you um, after the public trust liaison visits, uh, if that's okay with you, Chair Johnson. Sounds great. Okay. Thank you. Okay, great. So um, the first report that I have relates to the oath cards and admission ceremonies. I don't have new news here, but I just have important reminders that can help you for those schools that do conduct admission ceremonies at your schools about how to help uh, the new graduates um, get their admittee uh, bar number more quickly. Just as a quick show of hands, how many schools that are, are here in membership are still doing admission ceremonies uh, just in general, whether live or remote? Looks like everybody is. And um, is there anyone that is doing um, a remote ceremony or at least planned for this year? Okay, so we're back to in-person. Okay, that's great to know. So a couple of different things. As you know, we've, in, we've instituted a DocuSign program for the oath cards. And I have received an update from our attorney resources and consumer records department that will help you in processing uh, this information. Uh, first of all, uh, just as a reminder, the fees that the new admittees will have to pay uh, will depend on the time of year when they swear in. So the fee, uh, if swearing in prior to June 1, uh, will be higher, a full year fee. And then um, after June 1 will be a half year fee. Uh, if that plays into your planning, uh, that is something to know. And I've understood that some schools will set their formal ceremony after June 1st um, and having only those that have an immediate need to do so in May, for example, they'd like to start a job on, on May 20th or whatever the fact may be. So, uh, so that's one helpful reminder. The second one is, when you're returning the cards, many of the schools return cards in bulk. And when you do that, uh, first of all, please only use a PDF format. Uh, do not use a JPEG. For example, taking a photo that turns into a JPEG, use only PDF. Each individual licensee should have their own PDF form and uh, it should be named uh, with their first and last name. So for example, Natalie Leonard oath card, if it were my oath card. Uh, and doing that will really help the attorney uh, group to be able to assign the bar number more quickly. Uh, any questions about that? Okay, terrific. Well, thank you for the chance just to remind and thank you for everyone's uh, smooth acceptance and the smooth rollout of the DocuSign process. Uh, my final uh, my final announcement has to do with recent developments. And as you can see, sometimes there are many recent developments. We had a good conversation about one, uh, but this time coming up at the board meeting in September, uh, there are several more that will be a part of that. So the first one has to do with the possibility of a proposal that will be given to the Supreme Court for consideration regarding a portfolio bar exam, an alternative to the bar exam. This is for the consideration of the Supreme Court. Uh, the Supreme Court will decide whether or not that's something that will be considered going forward. The working group has created a draft document and that will be discussed at two points during which you can make public comment. The first of these is the September 1 Committee of Bar Examiners meeting. Um, and then the second one is the Board of Trustees meeting September 21st, 22nd. At that same Board of Trustees meeting, there'll be a discussion, of course, about the administration of the bar exam in, in February and July next year. And in addition, the package of admissions fee amendments. So um, those could be helpful to have on your calendar. And as a reminder, a written public comment can be submitted even now to the public comment addresses of CBE at calbar.ca.gov 
or bot at calbar.ca.gov. You can find those addresses on the top of the meeting agendas, or you can use a past agenda. We keep the same every time. Um, and similarly, you can sign up to make a public comment um, on those sites as well. And that form is the same every time. So you can pull the old link and, and still, uh, still, still sign up for that. Additionally, uh, just a reminder that you can, um, you can request um, email alerts re regarding these as well. So when you go to the agenda page, so about us meeting agendas, if you slide down to the bottom of that, then you can sign up for alerts for any of the state bar uh, governing boards or any of the committees. So for example, after this meeting, you could slide down to the bottom and ask for updates for the CBE meeting and board of trustees uh, to be aware when materials are posted for these. And uh, this sign up is available to anyone. It's a public forum. So anyone at your law school, any member of the public may sign up for those email alerts. Any questions about the sign up process or, oh, sorry, Audrey. I am so sorry. I had just one additional place where I know this is being discussed, the portfolio bar um, exam is tomorrow's uh, council on access and fairness um, council, is that what? committee on access and fairness. So COAF tomorrow also has it agendized, Natalie. And oh, great. At, at the September 1st special meeting of the committee of bar examiners, where this is the only agendized topic for the CBE's comments on the portfolio bar exam proposal, Susan Bakshan will also be there from your law school council. Uh, she's been on the working group on the alternative pathway. So um, she will also be there to give an overview of that proposal. Just, just a heads up. Oh, yeah. terrific. Mark your and calendars for the next two Fridays, huh? I'll be at all three, Audrey. I'll be oh, you're going to be tomorrow, tomorrow too? I will be at Committee of Bar Examiners on September 1st, and I will be at the Board of Trustees. Um, and Jackie Gardina from Ventura College of Law will be joining me, and Judge Reeser will also be joining me. Great. And the Council on Access and Fairness agenda is also on that same page. Go to the CalBar website about us meeting agendas. You'll be able to find the Council on Access and Fairness agenda, the Committee of Bar Examiners agenda, Board of Trustees agenda, and sign up for alerts for any of those. Thanks, Audrey. And thanks, Susan. Problem. And I'm just, I, I'm so sorry. This is very recent development. I believe when Amy was presenting, um, Mary Beth, you asked if the, there was time still to give comment on the lack of San Diego sites, and it is not going to come back on the September Board of Trustees meeting. The ask was for them, for the staff to research San Diego sites, get back to the board, and then move forward because the contract, we're already very behind a usual timeline of contracting. So the February 2024 sites that Amy described are, are going to be the sites. Thanks for that clarification. No problem. All right, well, thank you, everyone. We'll return to the staff report on the DEI SEAL program a little bit later, but first, I'd like to recognize the team that will be discussing the public trust liaison program, including our public trust liaison, Enrique Zuniga. Let's see. Um, and then also Tara Clark, Christian Harvey, and David Lane. Hello, everyone. And give me just a moment. Enrique has been detained for a moment. So um, I'd like to just set the stage and perhaps we can begin with the moral character portion and we'll explain why we brought uh, the moral character team. And uh, Enrique should join us in just a moment. In fact, he says he's just popping in. Okay, so uh, when we met in May, uh, you were introduced to a new office at the State Bar, the Public Trust Liaison's office, headed up by Enrique Zuniga, who will join us. We talked about the role of that office. It was relatively new. Now um, he's several additional months into the position. The program started at the beginning of the year, officially. And at part at that meeting, we received questions in uh, two main areas. One, the area of moral character, and two, the area of testing accommodations. The testing accommodations rules are still in the process of development, so we do expect additional change change there, but in the area of moral character, um, we do have a lot of information to bring back to you, either changes that are recent or um, 
things that were already in place that we wanna make sure that all of you know about in terms of resources. And just to give an example of how the public trust liaison works with the other departments here. And so at that time, oh, Enrique is here. So Teresa, if you wouldn't mind um, promoting him. Uh, we're going to bring him in to give an update about his experience of the last meeting, what happened since, and then turn it over to the moral character team to uh, talk about the resources um, as a result of that discussion. So Enrique, when you are ready, uh, we'd love to hear from you. And I think you're on mute right now. I was working on... Um the camera already in a moment. Sorry for the technical difficulty. So, Great. Okay. So as you were arriving, we gave a little intro um, to talk about uh, what, how we are bringing you here today, and uh, we're ready for your update. Wonderful. Um, I just wanted to start off by uh, providing a quick reminder of the Office of the Public Trust Liaison. We are here for members of the public to that are having problems with two, or issues with two particular areas, OCTC and admissions. As it pertains to this group, it will likely be more on the admission side, but let me tell you a little bit about the OCTC side. Um, if a person is having a problem with filing a state bar complaint, OCTC is Office of the Chief Trial Counsel. They handle a disciplinary action. If a person is having a problem with submitting complaints, or maybe they have an open complaint and want to provide additional information and they don't know how to do that, or they have a question about filing an appeal with the complaint review unit, they can reach out to me in special circumstances to help them out. Just to give you an example, I had a person contact me from India that due to our uh, the difference in countries, they weren't able to access our website. So through email, that person provided her complaint form and I was able to submit that to intake. So that's just an example of how the public trust liaison can help the public on the OCTC side. Now on the admission side, we take direct um, inquiries from applicants in all levels of the, of the process. I've had people uh, reach out to me the day before the exam that they couldn't print out their admissions ticket I had people uh, reach out to me after the exam that they need assistance with filing for a, for a, for a refund. Um, I've also had general questions about the admissions process and, or issues where the person wants to update something and they're not exactly sure how to do so. So just in, in general, the public trust liaison is here to, to facilitate and I would say maybe get an issue moving from the admission side or from the OCTC side, which is for discipline. Um, the primary purpose is to help applicants that are struggling. Sometimes I point them to, to relevant information on the website. Uh, a lot of times during bar exam, people reach out to me and simply forget um, deadlines and they reach out to me and I can provide a response for that. Um, the last time I was here, I remember that the bulk of the questions were around the character and fitness application process, which I'm not sure if uh, Natalie Leonard mentioned, we're gonna also have a presentation about with the moral character and fitness team to provide resources for that matter. But one of the key takeaways that I always like to tell people is that if an applicant is struggling with any part of the process, they maybe wanna update their, oh, something else that's really common. Um, we've had situations where a person registered as a law student with an EDU web, um, web address, and when they took the bar exam, they no longer had access to that EDU web address. So they reached out to me and we were able to allow them access so they can print out their um, their admissions ticket for the bar exam. So those are the type of troubleshooting things that that I can assist applicants with and much more really. Um, so one of the things that I always like to tell people is that the contact center 
is their first line to reach admissions related inquiries. We always have a person of the day that could answer anything from eligibility to, to bar exam issues or um, payment issues, or maybe they wanna know if, they, if they've submitted their application, it hasn't been accepted, et cetera. Now, in the event that the contact center um, is not providing the response that they were looking for, they need something a little bit more in depth, they can, at that point, either escalate to me with the request, or they can go to our landing page, and we have a form that allows them to put um, their applicant number, what they've tried to do to resolve that issue, and what they would like to see get done. That form gets escalated to me and other staff members, and we work with the applicant to try to find a resolution to their issues or maybe point them to the correct resources. So um, one of the things that, that the public trust liaison um, can't do, and I always like to stress this, is that we are not a legal representation for anybody. If a person is, for example, uh, denied moral character and fitness, um, the public trust liaison cannot advocate for them. Um, we cannot intervene in any type of disciplinary matter or any formal process. Um, we cannot um, reverse um, pending admission matters that have been determined by, let's say, the Commission of Bar Examiners or anything like that. We can't reverse a finding um, of a Chapter 6 notice. Um, and we also don't make uh, binding decisions or mandate policies. But what we can do is if you're going through an event and maybe you're not aware of the procedures, we can point you to avenues of review for procedures that are available to the applicant, um, things that are might not be very uh, well known. Uh, we have access to resources that we can share with the applicant. So at this time, <laughs> I would like to open it up if anybody has any questions or would like to, um, any questions for me or about the public trust liaison office. Actually, I might have the first one. So sure. Enrique, maybe you could talk a little bit too about the feedback loop with the admissions office in general, how you let us know about the types of questions you get so that we can also uh, alter and continue to enhance our communications with the public. Yes, absolutely. Because my staff are on the on the contact center, we are actually closer to the public than anybody else at the State Bar of California. A lot of times the contact center is aware of issues before anybody else in, in anywhere in the State Bar um, is. For example, um, we tend to receive trends uh, maybe before the bar exam, if somebody is having a difficult, this is very common. People are having a hard time in printing out their their admissions ticket. And we start seeing an uptick on those requests. I can actually communicate with, and I actually do communicate with members of admissions and says, hey, by the way, I've been receiving a lot of requests for admissions tickets. Has anything um, glitched on your end? Is, is everything normal? And we might get to the root of a problem before it starts. Also. Um, during um, during the bar exam, uh, some people reached out to me and communicated uh, issues with the exam center or issues with, um, with with something about the bar exam, and I'm able to communicate directly to to admissions. Also, um, I noticed trends before anybody else um, after the bar exam, and this I'm focusing on applicants. Um, applicants might reach out to me and say. Um, now they have an interest in in receiving a 95% refund. What do they have to do? And I might see an uptick on those requests. So and, and to answer Natalie's question, uh, the contact center really has their finger on the pulse. And since we deal directly with the public, we tend to see trends before anybody else. And luckily my position, I am I, I can communicate directly with admissions and give them a heads up or say, hey, this is coming down the pipeline. Um, what can we do to better serve our applicants? Thanks, Enrique. 
So at this point, I'd like to introduce Tara Clark, Assistant Director in the Office of Admissions, to uh, talk a little bit more about some of the moral character uh, resources that are available as a result of the discussion that you've had previously with Enrique. Thank you, Natalie. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having us. And I think as Natalie mentioned, I have my colleagues, David Lane, the attorney for the Moral Character Unit, and Christian Harvey, the program manager for our unit as well. Um, so I just wanted to point you to um, some of the resources we do have available on the website um, for moral character specifically, as well as some of the other units and admissions, we do have FAQs. Um, for moral character specifically, you can find them when you go to the moral character link. We've also created a landing page from the admissions homepage so you can access those FAQs more easily. And we are adding, we're planning to add more as well as some step-by-step -step help guides for those applicants that need the visual representation of how to say upload another document to the portal. Um, we also wanted to point you to the moral character guidelines. And so some of you may be familiar with this. It was a few years back, um, 2019 to 2020, we had a moral character working group um, that looked at the process. And ultimately one of the final products was this document, the moral character guidelines, where it gives um, staff, law schools, as well as applicants, uh, kind of an overview of the process and how things are generally considered in the process. So if you haven't taken a look at that, um, we strongly recommend that you do. This was created in conjunction um, with three law school deans or their representatives were on that panel. So we had one representative from each type of school. As well as um, just a reminder that moral character and the Office of Admissions, we do offer law school presentations as well to students. I can see some faces that I recognize from schools that we do it um, annually for. Um, so if you do have specific questions, you can always feel free to reach out to us or we're happy to come and present on moral character bar exam, testing accommodations, any of those things. So um, let me see if either of my colleagues have anything to add before it goes out. The, the only thing I have to add is that all of that information is available if you just Google State Bar of California Moral Character. The first result will get you to our, our page. And then if you scroll down, it has links to all of the information. Um, and just to echo what Tara said, we're always happy to talk to applicants about the moral character process. We welcome the opportunity. And I think I will add one more um, that we do also offer state bar day or we have in the past. So if your particular school, it doesn't make sense to have uh, us come and present. We, um, we have, I think the last couple of years offered state bar day where students can sign up and it's not just admissions, also office of chief trial counsel, some other folks um, come and speak to the applicants. So I think Natalie had her hand up a moment ago. Oh, you're on mute. There we go. A couple of questions about um, if a school would like to have the admissions team come and present. Uh, first of all, can the, the can the presentation be remote like this is right now? Yes. Yeah, so we're conducting all of the pre presentations remotely right now. OK. And then second, how would they go about signing up and about how far in advance do they need to sign up or does that depend? Um, it really depends on who who you'd like to come and present. I think some of the ones where we have multiple units presenting, it can take a little bit longer for us to coordinate. Um, if it's just moral character, we have several staff available. And I think in the past we had said that if they reached out to educational standards, you would get that over to the right group to make sure that we can coordinate appropriately. I'm happy to do that. And you can send those requests to law school regulation at calbar.ca.gov. If schools in a certain area, such as San Diego, wanted to to collaborate and do it all together, would that be all right with you too? Of course. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. Are there any other questions from the members? Maybe one thing to add is that during those presentations, we not only can present general information about the moral character process, but we can also have breakout rooms after the presentation in case applicants want to ask confidential questions that they about the moral character process that they don't want to broadcast to the whole room. Um, just to mention that. And I apologize, oh, Chris had his hand up. I do have one um, additional update I wanted to provide to the group. Um, so as you may, may or may not be aware, but the moral character rules as well as those for the practical training of law students and law office study are all under review with the court right now. For moral character specifically, it was mostly just trying to make the information um, more straightforward and easier for the applicants to understand, but you can find those agenda items if you'd like um, for the committee meetings of the board of trustees. We hope to hear something from the court um, and have them inactive or before the end of the year. So we'll see how that goes. And did you still have a question, Chris? 
Uh, no, actually, David, you mentioned I was going to give a plug for both for all of you. Uh, you've been really gracious and come up and and done Zoom and done all the individual questions, and it really does help our students out. So thanks. Thank you so much. It's always uh, nice for us to be able to talk to them too. Are there any other questions? Okay, with that, uh, I would uh, propose that we return to the diversity, the DEI SEAL program uh, to be presented by members of our Access and Inclusion Department. So I would ask to recognize Elizabeth Hom and Danielle McRae. Thank you. Elizabeth and Danielle, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Um, my name is Elizabeth Hom. I'm a program director in the State Bar's Office of Access and Inclusion. Uh, with me today is lead program analyst Danielle McRae. Um, and our office is responsible for administration of legal aid grants to nonprofits throughout California, including some law school clinics. Um, in addition, we also work on various policy initiatives related to access to justice and diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, we've brought projects um, before this group in the past for, for feedback and input, and we look forward to sharing with you today um, our DEI Leadership SEAL program, um, and um, would love to talk more about how uh, more law schools can participate. So I'll turn it over to Danielle now. Thanks, Elizabeth. And I uh, have, to have a presentation that I will share. So I'll get that pulled up. Wonderful. Yes, yeah, so as Elizabeth mentioned, my name is Danielle McRae and I'm a lead program analyst in the Office of Access and Inclusion. And today we're bringing to you uh, an overview of the DEI Leadership SEAL program, which is a new program that our office um, and the State Bar generally it launched earlier this year, um, bringing it to you all today because we would love to see more law schools um, participating in this program and also would love feedback um, from you all, both on how we can make the program more attractive to law schools, but also um, identify any potential opportunities to market this program to law students and get this on their radar um, as they're evaluating potential employers uh, after law school. So in developing this Leadership SEAL program over the last couple of years, we've really focused on a goal to recognize California employers who publicly commit to and implement DEI best practices. And those best practices are those that were identified in the diversity report card that the State Bar put out a year or so ago and uh, the corresponding calls to action. Um, and in developing this program, we held a lot of focus groups and interviews with stakeholders across various sectors and parts of the legal field in California and wanted to develop a program that prioritized diversity, equity, and inclusion, incentivized both commitment to some best practices and also action on those best practices, required participants uh, to continually evaluate and improve their DEI practices. We really um, taken the spirit of continuous improvement uh, and also recognizing that there are a lot of pre-existing DEI programs out there for employers, particularly in the private sector. Law firms have things like Mansfield Rule, for example. And so we wanted to avoid duplication with existing programs where we could, where it was appropriate. And so what the program is, is a, an actual seal um, that all legal employers that employ California attorneys are eligible to apply for. This includes law firms of any size, uh, in-house legal departments, law schools, nonprofit organizations, which um, in practice is often legal aid organizations, and then also government agencies with attorney staff. So employers must commit to pursuing at least five of a list of 10 DEI action items to be recognized as participating committed employers. And then after they receive that committed employer status, they then have a year um, in which to implement those action items. And if they implement five or more of those action items, they can be recognized as a DEI leadership seal recipient. Uh, and there are also tiers to the seals 
in um, corresponding with the number of action items that the employer chooses to implement. So they must implement at least five, that gets them a bronze tier. Uh, implementing seven would reach silver tier and then nine or more action items would be gold tier recipients. And in future years, we're envisioning that the list of action items will um, change incrementally and become more ambitious, ask more of the employers, again, in that model and spirit of continuous improvement. But I'll flag that those future changes um, would be made with a lot of stakeholder feedback. And um, the goal is to make them like incremental, iterative changes that build on the existing action items. We don't intend to kind of change, move the goalposts, if you will, but instead kind of tweak the action items over time um, to, to ask a little bit more of uh, participating employers. And so next I will walk you through relatively briefly what those 10 action items are. And I will flag too that the first two of the 10 action items are required. So regardless of whether or not an employer um, wants a bronze, silver, or gold tier, uh, these two need to be on the list. And that's because we thought that these were really foundational to an organization's DEI work. And so the first is collecting and maintain, maintaining demographic data. Um, and also under each action item on these slides is the documentation that we ask employers to submit to demonstrate that implementation once that implementation has occurred. Um, I won't read off all 10 of them for you, but just as an example, for the first one, we ask uh, employers to upload a description of the process by which they collect and analyze that demographic data. We considered, frankly, you know, asking folks to submit the data itself, um, but had some concerns about whether that would be um, a disincentive for employers to participate. And also the state bar wanted to be really mindful around um, asking for data if we weren't quite sure what we wanted to do with it yet. Um, and so right now the, the implementation or documentation requirements are around, um, again, that description of the data collection process. The second required action item is around creating a strategic DEI plan for the organization. So these remaining action items um, are a little bit more of a choose your own adventure. The first two are required, but then uh, employers can select um, of the remaining eight, which ones make the most sense for them as an employer. And those include things like calculating staff turnover and promotions by those demographic categories, comparing their California attorney hire demographics to the California attorney population, creating and sharing publicly a DEI statement, both on the organization's website and also on its job postings, Co uh, conduct stay and exit interviews with staff around DEI um, inclusion belonging at the organization, Similarly, survey staff, at least biennially, to gather feedback on the organization's DEI efforts, require annual employee implicit bias training, and that is for all um, employees, not just attorneys. Incorporate DEI work into performance advancement and compensation decisions, and also integrate DEI responsibilities into leadership team members' formal job duties. For larger organizations, which we define as those with uh, more than 100 California attorneys, we also ask that they maintain a DEI professional position on that leadership team. And so again, I know I went through those relatively quickly, but if you want more information on any of them, the State Bar website uh, has a ton of really great resources. There is um, more expansive information around what each action item requires, the documentation that would be required to demonstrate implementation of those action items, um, and then also some resources like an FAQ document. We have a resource guide, which is a PDF that um, provides best practices, things to consider when implementing the various action items as an employer, and then also the State Bar's diversity report card includes some calls to action, uh, which are spe sector specific um, calls to action best practices that uh, both employers and employees can implement in their workplace. And so, as I mentioned earlier, this is a new program for the State Bar. Applications for the first cohort closed earlier this year, end of March. 
And so staff then reviewed those applications for the committed employers. Um, it was ensuring that the application was completely filled out. But for those that had already implemented five or more of the action items, we were reviewing um, that documentation and ensuring that the action items had been uh, sufficiently implemented. And then those employers were eligible to receive a seal without having to wait for that uh, year long implementation window to close, if you will. And in that first cohort, the state bar received 79 applications that ultimately resulted in 34 seal recipients and 43 committed employers. Um, if you're doing the fast math and saying, Danielle, those numbers don't add up to 79, that's because we had two um, applicants that ultimately withdrew um, from participation in this first cohort. We are envisioning um, or expecting that the next cohort application deadline will be March of next year. That will be on an annual application cycle for the time being. And then um, also wanted to show you who these current employers are. So as you'll see, there are a lot of private um, SEAL recipients and committed employers. Most of those, um, uh, surprisingly, are law firms. There's a couple in-house legal counsel departments as well, um, but vast majority of those are law firms. Nonprofit uh, sector is primarily legal aid organizations. We have a couple government agencies, a a city attorney's office and the like. And then you'll see we have currently one law school in the first cohort, and that is Colleges of Law. And so we would love to see uh, more law school applicants in the next cohort um, and you know, find ways to, to engage with you all and make this program um, attractive to, to you all as law schools. And so some of the benefits that currently exist for participating employers, uh, they are listed on the State Bar's website. SEAL recipients, those that implement five or more of the action items, can use the SEAL on their own website and print materials. So things like their career website, job posting, promotional materials to clients or potential students. Uh, we're also envisioning facilitating opportunities for these employers to convene and discuss their DEI efforts, share best practices, share resources at future diversity summits, which are convenings that the State Bar holds um, with some regularity. And then also our office and the State Bar generally is continuing to explore additional benefits that we can provide to or can facilitate for participating employers and SEAL recipients. So that is the end of the presentation um, that I have in terms of the overview, but I do have a couple discussion questions for you all, places I would love to get your feedback. Um, but before I turn to my questions, do any of you have questions for me um, about what's been presented thus far? Yes, Mary Beth. Thanks for the presentation, Danielle. Um, I guess I have a little bit of a question about how it would work for our clinics. It seemed like some of the factors are very focused on employees um, when clinics are staffed by obviously a lot of students and we have just a few employees maybe per clinic. Um, would we just be focusing on the metrics relating to the the people who are hired? Would so you know, or would you look at who's being admitted to the clinics? Or I guess I just I'm not quite sure how the existing ten factors play out for the the model that many legal clinics are operating with. Sure. Uh, so my first reaction is that it would not need to be just the law clinic that would apply. I think the entire law school could consider applying as an employer. Um, but your point around how the action items fit in the law school context is super fair and is an ongoing conversation that we're having um, that we had with colleges of law as they were applying, as we were reviewing their materials, um, and something that we're continuing to think about how the action items apply in various sectors. Um, but yeah, I would say that it could, if the entire law school chose to apply rather than just the clinic, it would apply to um, the, the faculty and staff of that law school generally. Okay, yeah. I mean, I think it just requires sort of further thinking. Like when I think about 
our law school as a law school, I mean, a number of our faculty members, for example, are not licensed attorneys in California. They're licensed in other states. Um, and, num and, and when I think about who's doing law practice at our school, it is our clinical programs. And it would make some sense to me that our that our legal clinics would want to have this seal. Um, and and maybe the law school as a whole too, but I, I just think it's... Can I clarify that the program really is to encourage the employers, employers of California attorneys to prioritize diversity, equity, and inclusion. So it wouldn't necessarily have to be clinical focus because they're you know providing legal services. It could just, just be the school as a whole, as an employer, um, and and while we are focusing on California attorneys, I think it you know we we do you know look to see what other attorneys in the application you know that are employed in that sort of thing. Okay, thanks. That's helpful. Great. Okay. Well, seeing no other hands, I will jump into some of the questions I have for you all. But um, if you think of other questions as we go, please don't hesitate to share them. Uh, the first is: Are there any additional benefits? that we um, should or could explore that could make this program more attractive to employers. And I can go back to the slide of current benefits if that's helpful. I can move on to the next question and see if that jogs um, some other thoughts. There is also, um, we have a real interest in potentially marketing this program or putting this program in front of law students, um, because if we can get to a place where law students are looking to the seal as an indicator of, um, you know, an employer's focus on or interest in improving DEI, that might make them more attractive to law students as they're graduating and looking for places um, to, to do an internship or an externship or to work ultimately after school. Um, if we can get to, a, to that place, I think that would create buy-in um, for the program and the profession generally. Uh, be interested in any reactions to that or thoughts on um, you know, law students' interest in a program like this. Devin. Yeah, since the focus is like on employment, whether while in school or afterwards, like the thing that popped into my head is sort of many of us probably don't deal a lot with career advising or sort of that kind of stuff. But it would probably yeah, behoove yeah. you all to put together a gathering of like all the career deans, all the externship directors um, to really talk to them. Like I while we were talking, I forwarded the link to our career dean because I I've seen this stuff, but I doubt like it's ever made a connection with them at all. Um, right. I know like in Northern California, there's a group called BASE, which is the externship directors from all the Northern California schools, and they are regularly connected to each other. So there's a pre-existing group you all could tap into, but they're probably the audience to both get in front of and actually sort of ask for information from. Great. That's really helpful. And then the last question I had is we plan to bring... Um, some version of this presentation or information about the Leadership SEAL program to the Law School Assembly in November. Um, is there any additional information or data um, or resources that would be helpful um, in kind of packaging this for that venue and meeting? Yes, I saw a couple. Oh, lots of hands. Um, yeah, let's I'm not sure who was first. Go ahead, Mary. Okay, I just think it would be helpful to see what the seal looked like. Oh, absolutely, yes. So that is talking, on... I'm like, what is it? Right? Yeah, it so... I might've missed it. No, it's okay. It was on the first slide, but I actually can pull up the gold, silver, and bronze um, versions of this too. We should add that in here, but this is the kind of general program seal, if you will. Uh, but we also have gold, silver, bronze seals as well. Um, and I was just going to add, um, kind of following up on Mary Beth's comment um, and seeing that there's only been so far one um, school that is participating or has you know participated in this initiative is how 
is for um for it to be considered how we might package this in a way that law schools actually see themselves as being able to participate in this initiative um because it's it sounds like perhaps um the schools we've just not been aware or or maybe it's not entirely clear how we fit into it so um given Mary Beth's comment, I think that might be helpful for that meeting to, to just kind of package it to how law schools would be able to join this initiative. Great. Yeah, that's that's helpful. Thank you. One thing that um, has come up in previous conversations, and apologies for my quick scrolling here, uh, one thing that's come up in previous conversations is creating an FAQ or a resource guide or something that's specific to thinking through how the action items would apply in a law school context. Um, and so helping, you know, make that connection so law schools can can see what it would look like for them. I think that's great. Um, yes, Natalie, you're on mute. Here we go. Toward that end, some questions you might get from schools relate to um, if there are adjustments the school should make as if um, if it's part of a university, which many of the schools would be, or you might get interest from a school's incubator. Some schools have incubators that are not designed for students. They're actually designed for graduates once right. they complete their studies. And uh, perhaps an incubator would like to know if they by themselves can mm -hmm. uh, request the seal. They, they absolutely could. Um, we uh, have this open to, you know, if a firm, for example, is a nationwide firm, but only their California office wants to apply, or if it, there's like a corporate legal department in a large company that wants to apply, just the legal department can apply. So we we are trying to make this um, program flexible so that um, uh, kind of employers of any of, of multiple kinds can participate. Great. Um, and so then in terms of next steps, um, if you're interested, uh, if your law school um, is interested in applying or even just having, you know, a more in-depth conversation about what it might look like at your law school, State Bar staff are happy to set up a time to provide some technical assistance and guidance and help um, evaluate feasibility, implementation of the action items. Um, there's an email inbox set up specifically for this program, which is DEI leadership seal at calbar.ca.gov. Also, if um, this program may be of interest to your students, please do feel free to share the program information and the website with your career services staff or with the students directly. Um, the State Bar website has a lot more information around what the action items are. It also has a list of the current seal recipients and participating employers, um, and again, has that resource guide um, and FAQ. And then also, because this program is relatively new, we are um, still really thinking through how to best uh, make it accessible to all different types of employers, make it attractive to all different types of employers, and are continuing having those conversations um, with folks really across sectors. So if you're interested in providing that type of feedback, um, please do feel free to reach out. We would love to have you um, in those conversations as well. Great. Well, I believe that's all that I have. And I thank you so much for your time. I'd okay. like to thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. So now I think we'll move into the discussion of the pilot project for online access to state Nidia. Yeah, Nidia, thank you. Uh, so we'll just give you a quick update on that, Teresa, whenever you are ready. This yeah. is a, one of the most requested uh, items of the past, so I think you'll be very glad to hear what we're working on. Just give me one second, everyone. I'm just going to share. Um, I just have one slide on this. All right. I don't know why it looks black on my screen when I get it presented. Um, okay, let's, here we go. All right, so as um, Natalie mentioned, we are working on something that I hope will be exciting to all of you, which is about how we can um, send past fail lists through an electronic means. So um, I 
assume this is probably going to be pretty exciting and, and maybe um, very helpful for you all, given um, the historical practice, which you're probably all aware, is that we would um, send these results physically to law school deans um, the Monday after they were released. So, um, you know, we are trying to brainstorm a few other methods and pilot a few other methods of um, giving this materials to law schools. And so one of them, the first method that we tried was sending the June 2023 first year law exam, first year law students examination results uh, via email. So this was distributed to law school deans um, via email. And um, that was one method of testing, giving these type of results to law schools. Um, and then we're also piloting another method, which is more of a uh, two two factor authentication uh, login to a portal. And this type of portal uh, kind of looks similar to like a Dropbox portal or uh, a Google Drive, where you can um, you know drop files into that um, into that shared drive. Um, and so that's the second method that we are testing right now. Um, and right now that's being tested with law school, uh, law school council deans. So some of um, some people involved in, from this panel and then also CS bars and we have seven schools participating. So thank you very much for those of you who are participating. Um, we are still in the early stages of testing that second pilot. And so we are going to, you know, evaluate both of these methods to see which is going to be the best long-term solution, you know, in terms of, um, security and privacy and those um, and those things. And then we will um, share um, an update when we have one. But so that's what's going on right now. And um, as I said, we will keep you updated on our progress. Um, I do want to also note a couple of things, which is that even though we might we are piloting this way of sending results electronically, um, we just want to make sure to remind everyone that it is uh, the school's responsibility to make sure that they're, you know, storing these lists appropriately um, for any kind of reporting or what have you that might come up. Um, and so along with that, we do want to also just briefly mention um, to please be cautious when re uh, requesting duplicate lists close to reporting deadlines, um, because you know, when they're kind of last minute, it can be hard to make sure those materials arrive on a timely manner, um, which can, you know, cause delays for, for everyone. Um, and so, yeah, like, like I said, we'll keep you updated on the results. Um, a final thing that I'll note is that uh, it is on our radar that schools are interested in receiving this information in an Excel file. Um, so that is something we know about. And um, it's not a part of this particular pilot, but it is on our radar, and perhaps that's something that we can look into in the future. Um, and I think now I will ask if there's any questions. Sure, Mary. I don't have a question. I just wanted to say, woohoo, good job. That's what we like to hear. Thank you. Devin. I, I will second the woohoo. Uh, I um, I think you all know, but for many of the UBE jurisdictions, we get those uploads uh, in a Dropbox and it works so well. It's so easy to navigate. Um, and so, you know, I know California, we, we live in a state where everything is unique and we always go our own way, but I would strongly endorse just use the UBE process. It's so easy. Um, and the Excel thing, I, I would like scream woohoo 50 times if we got if we got them actually in a document we could manipulate. So, you know, you want a lot of prospective woohoos, do that and you'll make us all very happy. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Teresa. All right, I'll pass it back to you. Okay, so um, Nidia, if it's okay with you, we'll move on to the law school meetings. So when we last met, we began the discussion of the topics that would be included in the annual all California law school meetings. So this year, the registrar's meeting will take place on October 19th. 
And then the law school assembly will take place on November 2nd. So that's actually the very first place where we already took your feedback. In the past, we used to hold them sequentially, sometimes on, um, on consecutive days. And we got the feedback that people either got confused or found it difficult to fit both meetings into their schedule. So uh, there's the first example of us appreciating and acting upon your feedback. Uh, with the registrar's meeting, most of the time we're focused on technical details and records, of course, and based on your feedback and also the comments from CS bars, what we're thinking about that for that um, would be another live demo involving the portal, in particular talking about some of the changes that we have made and will make to the homepage, primarily to make it easier for people in general and in particular new students registering or asking a question for the first time to be able to use the portal. Uh, also giving any update that we have on e-pass lists at that point uh, to the extent it's available, possibly an update related to e-transcripts um, if that becomes possible. And we also were considering bringing the public trust liaison. I think that would be very helpful for the law school assembly for sure. Do you think that that's an office that the registrar's team would like to know about as well? And we could do just a show of, of hands if there are not specific comments or I'd be interested in any comments you have as well. I see one hand, maybe, maybe not. Yeah. Also, Natalie, I, I would suggest yes for the registrar's office, just because of the nature of what the public liaison suggested that he was handling bar admission tickets and those kinds of things. Those calls go first to my registrar and me, sometimes simultaneously. So mm -hmm. I suspect a lot of registrars would like to know that that's out there. Okay, and then similarly, thinking about the bar exam administration plan, which uh, will be further publicized by then. At times in the past, we've included those details, what you can bring, et cetera. But do you think that the registrar's uh, responsibility stops at the point of application or would they like a more full presentation on the bar exam? Um, what would be your experience at your school? Um, Mary Beth and then Devin. Well, at our school, I mean, I, first of all, I think that the registrars, the more information they can have, the better just in order to facilitate sending people in the right direction. I'm not sure that they need the the level of detail about the the administration plan. I mean, that would be our bar support person. And I do think that you know, most schools at this point have a director of bar support, and mm -hmm. it's really important that that person get this level of inf information. Some of those people might be going to the registrar's meeting, um, but at least for our school, that would definitely be not the registrar's responsibility. Okay, great to know. And Devin, how about for you? Yeah, I, I agree with what Mary Beth said right at the beginning, which is the more people having more information, the better. Like most of that stuff ends up in my office as the bar person at Santa Clara. But, you know, students never know who to call, never know who to email. And the more my colleagues are able to answer questions and, and sort of just like help students in the moment, the better off things are for everybody. Okay, that's great to know. Uh, so that's what we were thinking about for the registrar's meeting. And again, it will be held online as it was last year. We are getting universally positive feedback about hosting these meetings online rather than um, in person, north and south, as we did in the past. Um, the second meeting will be the law school assembly taking place on November 2nd. So first and foremost at that meeting, will be state bar related developments. So whatever the current status is related to the bar exam, uh, related to admissions rules, related to the fee package, related to the portfolio bar exam, you can feel confident that those will be uh, front and center as part of the exam. And depending on the uh, time needed to cover those elements, the amount of space that we have for other focus topics could vary. We also hope to bring the DEI seal 
program back. And then based on your feedback in the spring, we had um, a difference of opinion between law school council and CS bars as to the most important topic, but then CS bars changed their position. At that time, CS bars was most interested in focusing on best practices for online education, while the law school council identified generative AI as the key issue. And they've come around to your point of view. As a focus topic, would you still consider generative AI as, as a key issue um, for this meeting? And if so, how many of your schools have a formal policy in the area of generative AI so far, if any? So it looks like UC Davis does have a formal policy. We, we've been in touch with UC Berkeley that had one of the first policies back toward the beginning of this year. Have, are any other schools yet? We're still working on ours. Mm -hmm. Okay. Same for us. We're in process and, too. Okay, and probably once created, it will continue to evolve. So, uh, would we agree that this seems to be the the most important problem? Um, the most important topic of the day and thinking about how a regulator may be looking at this uh, could be an interesting insight as well. Okay, so uh, that's good to know. Thank you for sharing that information. Um, in addition, one thing we wonder is that last year when we met, we brought an expert in the area of, um, of student loans and student loan forgiveness. There were some special short-term issues in place at that time. Uh, a lot has changed and a lot has happened in the world since then. And I, I'd like to recognize Cody to talk a little bit about a topic that we could bring in that area and to see what the group thinks about this. Yeah, thank you so much, Natalie. Um, as I mentioned just briefly prior to my um, starting here with the bar, my experience was a decade of work in student loan policy. So I was thrilled to see this topic uh, come to the forefront. Um, I'll keep it short because there's so much happening in that space, but um, the top lines are this, uh, for millions, tens of millions of people, federal student loan payments are going to restart for the first time since March of 2020. On top of that, there is monumental shifts in the student loan system regarding student loan servicing companies, new repayment plans. And then there's also really visible updates such as uh, the Supreme Court decision. Uh, all of this, uh, the Supreme Court decision around President Biden's debt cancellation plan. All of this has created just a certain air of confusion both for current students and current borrowers who are in repayment. And so it could be quite valuable to just identify new opportunities to make uh, payments more affordable, um, identify the programs that currently still exist on the books, because there are some great misconceptions right now. Um, and frankly, just bring folks up to speed about everything that's happened really over the last few years. So I won't get into the weeds because there's a lot to talk about there, but I think broadly my, my takeaways would be there's a great deal of confusion and a little bit of information could be really helpful uh, to folks who either work with students, current students, and you know other stakeholders. So we have no doubt that this is of great importance to your graduates and also to your students who aspire to be graduates in the future. Uh, do you see this as a valuable topic for the state bar to choose to bring the law schools together to discuss? I'm seeing three heads nodding, four heads nodding, five heads nodding. Okay, so it sounds like this is something that we can bring back. Um, and we may reach out to you to find out a little bit more about what your experience has been, what your LRAP programs are, are like, or how they're adjusting you know, in preparation for something like this as well. And our plan is to send out the invitation shortly after the Labor Day holiday. They will always include a place for, uh, for administrators to ask questions as well. What really helps to enrich the program is if we do get that feedback, not only from all of you as we have been, thank you, but also to get it from the attendees. And we value feedback both on a strategic level, hey, we need to know about bar exam programs in general, but also on a specific level. So for example, these are the top three questions I get from students. I know the answers, but my students continue to ask them, can you reconsider how you share? or here are the top two questions where we're not sure about the answers. That type of feedback is incredibly important to making this useful. 
Um, the other thing we'll survey you about, and we'll reach out to the public too, is we'd like to know about the tools that you use when you have large uh, Zoom electronic type meetings. What are the interactive tools you've tried? For example, Pigeonhole or Jamboards or other types of features that you think have worked well, because they may be things that we will uh, look into as well to uh, encourage you uh, to participate actively and to connect with each other during the meeting. Mm -hmm. And are there any specific tools that come to mind right away? It looks like Susan has some ideas. I actually just wanted to um, follow up to Cody's comment about the financial mm -hmm. information. I think what might be super helpful would be links, like when students ask, where do they need to go? And so if if the update at the law school assembly could include a, lit, a, a shorthand list of links for information about existing programs, new programs, updates, it would be very helpful to have that all in one place. I feel like it is all over the universe at the moment. Um, as for Zoom tools, I am a purist. I don't like a lot of third-party vendor in my Zoom meetings. I teach in a hybrid program. I teach in an online class. And I find that a lot of them don't play very nice. And they do cause a drag when holding a large meeting that is terribly difficult. Um, I am a big fan, however, of the Zoom breakout room. I'm a big fan of using Zoom's own built-in things like polls and whiteboards because it plays nice and it's seamless. Um, I'd stay away from third-party vendor. Great to know. So Nidia, we have about four minutes left. Are there any uh, closing thoughts or comments that you might have or questions for the group about the upcoming meetings? No, not at this time. I just wanna thank everyone for the wonderful discussion. I feel like this was a very helpful meeting and also to, to the bar for the updates. Um, I think we all have a, a lot of information to take back to our schools and perhaps further maybe comment to submit on some of the topics. So we're thankful. I'm thankful for the opportunity. Well, thank you, everyone. We appreciate your attendance and your engagement today. And we look forward to seeing you at the law school meetings before too long. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.